Hey everybody, welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here, uh, fresh from New York Comic Con, and man, do I have con crud. I can't tell you. Uh, I went to work today at the radio station. I'm about uh, 50% as far as uh, energy and uh, my voice, and because of that, I have to uh, lean on the uh, great stockpile of wonderful panels I have from uh, Cincy Comic Con from last month. And I'm uh, presenting today a nice hour-long panel with Marty Pasco. Uh, Marty's been on the show many times before. It was at my suggestion that uh, since he take advantage of uh, having Marty as a guest, I'm glad they did. He had a blast, and we had a lot of fun. And literally, the very first panel of Cincy Comic Con was this one-on-one with me and Marty. Uh, we've talked before about his animation career, his uh, insight on uh, the comic business, working for years at DC Comics, uh, his work in uh, syndicated comic strips like The World's Greatest Heroes for DC, the uh, the Star Trek uh, comic strip coming right off the 79 film. Uh, Marty's done it all. Uh, animation, live action uh, television, the Twilight Zone show from the 80s, uh, shows like Simon and Simon and Roseanne, uh, and uh, it was great to talk to him uh, in this uh, panel. So uh, no sponsorship, nothing, because I'm, I'm uh, really low energy. But I had to put out something, so I'm really glad that I've got this great stockpile of panels from Cincy Comic Con, and more are going to come in the days and weeks ahead. So enjoy this conversation with me and Marty Pasco on today's Word Balloon. Thank you, League of Word Balloon listeners, for your support. If uh, you would like to support the show and subscribe ver- via Patreon, you don't have to. Word Balloon was free. It'll always be free. But if you want to support the show, go to wordballoon.com. Check out our uh, Patreon uh, page at patreon.com slash wordballoon, and it'll give you all the information on how to subscribe to the show. Thank you, League of Word Balloon listeners. Here's a, a freebie today with Marty Pasco on Word Balloon. Thank you for coming out. Welcome to Cincy Comic Con. I hope uh, it's it's literally the first, it's the second hour of the con, but I hope your first hour was very enjoyable. I hope this second hour is enjoyable as well. I'm very excited to have our guest. My name is John Suntress. I host it's, a. It's only been an hour? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, Just I, such tone. I host a podcast called Word Balloon, and I'm uh, very excited to. Uh, I've had him on my show uh, many times. I always get great audience feedback when we talk, but this is an opportunity to have a live conversation with uh, with a great writer. Not just his DC comic work, stuff like Superman and the Joker, and uh, those are the two. That, and Black Hawks, his great reboot of Black Hawks in the 80s. But uh, Secret Six. Secret Six, of mm-hmm. course, thank you. But uh, certainly a television writer as well, Simon and Simon. Yeah. Okay, well, he winces. I'll, I'll bring another big show, and I'll, but he's going to wince again, Roseanne. I'm still alive, and I'm still working. <laughs> and animation work like that. Uh, there is a tomorrow, not a yesterday. <laughs> absolutely. Batman, Mask of the Phantasm, one of the principal writers of that as well. Please welcome <laughs> Marty Pasco, everybody. <laughs> Good to see you, man. Uh, glad, I'm glad to, glad to be here. Yeah, Excellent. And, um, when it's time for the obituary, what time is it now? Um, I'll call you, all right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. My, uh, well, sadly, what, I, what we engrave on that tombstone will be your writing. I will say that it would be my privilege, not my pleasure, because yeah, I well, like having you around and I like talking. I can't be any more embarrassed because I'll be dead. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so let's, uh, you know, and I'm sure people have questions. Um, when, when did you break, like, DC was your first big break, would you say? Um, was there stuff prior to DC? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> God. Comic wise? Oh, God, it really is. <laughs> this is your life. Exactly. Where's Ralph? Ralph, 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 Ralph Lewis. Lewis. Yes. Do you recognize this voice? Oh. You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of those is that voice? Yes. <laughs> there were several of those. Now, um, actually, uh, what happened was uh, Doug Mensch, um, a wonderful writer. Uh, was writing for the Warren books, Creepy Eerie and Vampirella, and uh, he, we were corresponding. He became a subscriber to this fanzine that I was doing, and I wanted to break in, and Warren was the only publisher at the time that was accepting over the transom submissions. Wow. So I took a short story, a horror story that I'd won an award for um, uh, in, in high school, and in my senior year in high, I turned that into a comic book script. Um, using a format that Doug had shown me, and it it sold right out of the gate, and uh, and was 
published under Doug's name. <laughs> by oh, no really. yes. oh, that yes. sucks. Well, they, they fixed it later. But um, what was interesting about that was it never got that easy again. <laughs> <laughs> was Louise Jones your uh, editor then? No, no. She, she came along a lot uh, later. There was a guy named John Cochran. I don't know what became of him. He okay. was the editor. And then Marv Wolfman followed after him. And I did that for a couple of years. Did but you have any DC, go, well, I was going to say before we leave Warren, did you have many interactions with Jim Warren? Uh, oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always love when I have a conversation, I land on a landmine. And, you know, well, I'll, I'll tell the story. I, I've told it before, but um, Jim had the longest memory for slights of anybody I've ever known. He was on a panel in New York with Neil Adams and a bunch of other people. And Neil started to pontificate about how comics as we know them will be dead in 10 years. Well, in a sense, he was right, because in 10 years thereafter, we had graphic novels, uh, we had non-code books, we had all kinds of things that were comics, but didn't resemble comics as we knew them then. But Jim took exception to this, and there was this vigorous debate, and I stood up and I asked a question that was sincere, but got a big laugh from the audience because of sarcasm that they in is assumed. And Jim scowled at me, and I didn't think anything of it because, you know, I'm just this kid. A year later, same convention, I find myself in an elevator with Jim Warren. And I'm standing in the corner, and he's staring at me. And the, the elevator's crowded. We go up several floors, everybody gets off the elevator, and then finally it's just him and me as we're getting to my floor. He's, he's up above. And he finally looks at me and he says, I know you. You insulted me at this convention a year ago. I ought to bust your nose. <laughs> and at that point, the elevator door opens, and I say, well, that would really be a case of the shit hitting the fan, wouldn't it? And I got out of the elevator. <laughs> Outstanding, Red. Uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to ask if, because um, you, you started to say that it was never as easy as it was for that first submission. Mm -hmm. um, you use at DC. You worked, you know, under Julie Schwartz, the, mm -hmm. the editor for Superman, mm -hmm. and the, uh, Julie had a reputation of taking a story idea. I mean, explain to me what. Explain to me the process. It's better to hear it from you in terms of you having a story idea and pitching it to Julie. Give us the process. You go in, you sit down, you say, I'd like to do a story about Brainiac. And within five minutes, it becomes a story about Luther. <laughs> <laughs> so was he, you know, it's funny, before we started recording, we were talking about how controlling Gene Roddenberry could be mm -hmm. with Star Trek. Was it like that with Julian Superman? And or was, you know, why, why would the change happen? With Julie, you had to earn his trust. Um, they had a whole complicated idea at DC at the time about you know, bringing you up through the ranks and, and getting you to the point where you were ready to take on the big titles. And there was a system for that because of the way the books were structured. There were backup stories and uh, uh, short anthology stories as you could Yeah, think. eight pages, five pages even. Yeah, and then you would get to the point where you knew you would arrive when they stopped rewriting your dialogue. <laughs> I got a day with Julie, no, oh, about three years. Wow. Well, you know, Julie got to the point where he said, you know, you're a pretty good dialogue man. And I said, thank you. And repressed the impulse to say, why are you still rewriting it then? You know? <laughs> and he actually said to me at one point, well, you know, they're paying me, I have to do something. You know, interesting. interesting. He literally would th thought he had to, you know, make at least one or two changes, because if he didn't, he wasn't justifying his salary. Interesting. Yeah. How many other editors of like the classic editors like that did you work with? I know you worked with Joe Orlando on uh, on some of the the mystery and uh, supernatural stuff. Yeah, Joe was Joe was good because he wouldn't really touch your copy. Um, the other editors that I worked for were writers originally and some of the best writers in the business, and I learned tremendous things from them. I mean, my God, Jerry Conway, Len Wein, um, and, and some of the great artists, too, Joe Hubert, um, Carmine Infantino. 
All of that was a, tr a tremendous learning experience. Um, and I, I, I kid Murray Bolton off and Julie Schwartz only out of writerly ego because two of the worst lines of dialogue that have ever appeared under my byline were not mine. And I mean, Murray was the kind of guy, he'd walk down the hall and he'd be standing there and if you looked like you were under 25, he'd say, oh, you kid, or Pasco, what do the kids say now for hep? <laughs> hep, in the 70s. And, uh, yeah, and I said, uh, hip? <laughs> And if you've lettered the hep, just take the whiteout pen and eliminate those two little, those, those three little stems and change it from hep to hip, you know. Jeez. Really, I, I, he, he had a series called Ghosts, and they were all anonymous because they were supposed to be true stories, right? So all funny. I, I, didn't realize I, that. Let, I used to buy that. I let go the whole idea, I'm going to be rewritten because my name's not going to be on it, but... I, I did this story about a, a ghost cop, and it, there's a scene where the, the, the cop appears out of the, the fog, and uh, somebody says to somebody about a character who has a gun, look, he's got his rod out. <laughs> I think that's different. It went past the code. Nobody thought anything about it. And I did a story... I did a story for Julie with the Adam, and they, they, they had this thing called the time pool, where he'd go back in time and, you know. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's awesome. awesome. It's the time pool series. Okay. Um, and so we did one of these. And the idea was uh, October 31st, 1939, World of the Worlds. Okay. He goes back in time, and he's mistaken for... A Martian, right? <laughs> and there was, it, it was um, Mike Gre one of Mike Grell's first stories. All fantastic. He illustrated it. And I remember I was in college when the thing came out, and I picked up the book. I didn't we, we didn't get comps at that point. And I picked the book up, and I'm reading this in the cafeteria, and I get to the line of dialogue that Julie has inserted. Take that, you midget Martian! <laughs> I dropped the tray. There was like mess of food all over the floor. I was like, what? You know. So I got over that frustration, though. Pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty quickly. You know. No, right, those kind of frustrations inside. It had to be pretty cool being a college person and being a published writer. The thing about writing comics that served me very, very well later on was a very early experience in seeing how other people interpret your work and learning how to work with their strengths and weaknesses, how to play to them and how not to. And that has served me well. Um, and I, I don't think that writers and artists play together as well anymore as they used to, um, as far as I can tell. Um, there's so many egos invested in this business. And there's an awful lot of struggle for creative control. So at least this is what I perceive. Uh, not necessarily everybody's experience, certainly, but uh, um, there's this very strong desire, I think, on a lot of artists coming up to write it themselves. But not everybody has those chops. <clears throat> Excuse me. Not everybody is Frank Miller. Not everybody is Walt Simonson. Um, you think Huber was a guy that obviously could write and, and draw as well? I've enjoy I enjoyed his last output of graphic novels. But I don't think Joe did it any earlier than he was ready. Okay. Because as good as he was at what he did as an artist, he knew he had a lot to learn as a writer. He learned from Bob Kaniger. <clears throat> and those kinds of collaborations where people are in rhythm, in sync with each other, but are also critical of each other's work and know how to express that criticism in terms that don't damage the ego. That's where those great collaborations come from. And I would argue from what I, I know of it that, like for example, John Byrne and Chris Claremont and X-Men didn't have that kind of relationship. Um, I don't know how much... Can you give me an example of a great writer-artist collaboration that is more recent, more contemporary, that is generally, you would think, among fans, considered to be very effective? Bendis and Oming on Powers. I mean, I, I think a lot of the creator-owned books today are literally the writer does with that in mind. It's like, hey, I don't want to step on your territory. We are doing this book together. 
what A, what do you like to draw, and B, please, if you've got a better way than my script of conveying visually what you want, please ask or please jump in. Mm -hmm. And I know Brew Baker and Steve Efting work like that, and a lot of Ed's uh, artists that he works with and stuff. Because I think you're right. I mean, and it's certainly in the 90s, it became art first, writing second. But I think in response to that in the modern age, so there's a couple examples. Well, I'll give you an example from Hubert and Kanegar. There was a great deal of trust involved in that relationship, and it was also true that they were both very, very fast. Um, the way they would do the, uh, the war books, well, first of all, let me back up. Kanegar was probably the most prolific writer in comics beside Stanley. For how many decades? Three decades? Uh, almost four? Well, he started in 41, and he officially retired in 73, so there, there you go. go. And Bob, on a little portable typewriter, would write eight pages on the train coming in from Long Island before his workday started, and another eight pages on the train going home. <laughs> Joe Kubert was very, very fast. Routinely, let me back up a step. At DC, it was always, he never let the artist who's available go away without work. You never let them, you always have something ready for them. And that was the pressure that the writers were always under. But Joe would call up Bob at like eight in the morning and say, well, I finished the uh, Sergeant Rock. You got anything else for me? And Bob would say, uh, come in at uh, three. On the train, Bob would write 24 pages of comics. Wow. Eight in the morning, eight, you know. In the office and eight on, home, on the way home. Exactly. Crazy. And when uh, Hubert would come in, he'd sit down and they'd take out a, a ream of eight and a half by 11 paper, and Hubert, inside of 15 minutes, would thumbnail the entire job sitting there with Bob. Wow. And Bob would say, no, 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 maybe this angle would work better. But I don't know. And he would walk away at the end of the day with the book essentially thumbnailed. Wow. And it would be penciled in a matter of like two or three days. And Bob, I mean, uh, uh, Joe was one of those guys like uh, Jim, Jim Aparo, who, because he did the whole thing, he didn't really type pencil. It was just, it was just shapes indicated you know, it was some, in, in some cases pra practically stick figures, and the rendering would be done in the ink pen. And it, it's just, you know, amazing. I mean, Walt Simonson was like that too, but Walt was a little more painstaking. I, I, I don't mean to speak of him in the past tense, he's still working, he's still sure. this, but oh, yeah. I'm saying from my point of view, when you were as when I were, yeah. yeah. You've had great collaboration. And by the way, folks, honestly, because Marty and I can lapse into conversation. So please, if you do have questions, yeah. please please come up and step up. And you know, we can stop our talking and get questions from you. But three, three, three words, John. Learn to interrupt. <laughs> Learn to say, if Marty, you, shut up, you're around. No, no, it's all good. And if you, know, if you hear, honestly, if you go back and look at my Word Balloon archive of podcasts, Marty and I have marathon conversations. And we don't realize it. And it's like, you know, Marty, we've been talking for three hours. Really? And it's like, because we are. We're, we're really happy to talk and, and, you know, get things going. But again, so. How about the things we're going to talk about? Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. you know, please, let's, let's get yeah. into some of these. I'm just looking at the time. No, absolutely. No, you know, um, if you follow Marty on Facebook, which I would encourage you to do, I, I think he has really interesting ideas about the business, where it is now, where it might be going, and some of the concerns. One of your jobs back in the 90s was you were the liaison a lot when a film company. Well, it was a little more recently than oh, that. Oh, excuse me. Early 2000s? Essentially, the job I had um, it was enlarged and morphed into something that is a component of the job that Jeff Johns has with DC Entertainment now. Uh, it was my job to uh, coordinate <clears throat> the uses of the, the properties, the rights that the various divisions had to all of the characters. And I used to refer to myself as the director in charge of being yelled at by Burbank. I would have these screaming matches. I mean, not matches, I just sat there and just, you know. Friday, when Friday afternoon was hell, because Friday afternoon was when Al Goff at Smallville would call up 
and in a stream of profanity. What the, what do you mean we can't use green air? What do you mean we can't? You know, and I was, as I say, you know, I was the guy who had to say, well, no, you can't use Alec Holland because that's part of the Swamp Thing property, and Joel Silver has an option on it, and you can't do this because, the, you know, and it just frustrated everybody. And this is when, obviously, independent producers and studios had these licenses. Well, it, it was a period of transition because for licensing purposes, the character groups were all considered discreet. They were not in the business of presenting a, a unified universe. Exactly, exactly. And this was alien to Marvel, in fact, when I was uh, developing Spider-Man uh, for Marvel Animation. Stan Lee kept asking me why I was asking the questions that I was asking. Uh, because was, this, was this the 90s Spider-Man cartoon? Yeah. Go yeah. on. And we had a very awkward meeting with executives from, uh, you know, Ron Perlman's company, um, and Stan and Avi Arad, and Stan's pitching things like, well, well, maybe the kingpin can come in here. And I'm saying, excuse me, can we use the kingpin on the show? He says, what are you talking about? And I said, well, what have you sold to Fox? <laughs> You've sold the Spider-Man property, but why do you want to give away the store? Why do you want to give them Daredevil? Why do you want to give them? It's a separate license. And the, the guys from New Line are sitting there going, that makes Good sense. Good job. Good job. You were some Marvel at the time, yeah. And that was when I was dead in the water with Stan Lee. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. That bad? Oh, yeah. Well, because he hadn't thought of it. Sure. Right. And uh, the, the other experience was uh, trying to work out the pilot, which I was committed at, at that point to write. <laughs> and suddenly, as the writer and the producer, the writer-producer on the show, I'm reduced to taking dictation in this meeting. Stan Lee and a toy executive, Avi Arad, are batting around all of these ideas. Oh, and then they can do this, and then they can do that, and I'm scribbling the notes. And at one point, I look up and I say, guys, is this, is this a two-parter? And Stan says, no, what do you mean? I said, well, you're in act four now. <laughs> you know? No sense of structure. Um, and, and Stan, you know, he didn't really write full scripts. He'd never really written screenplays. It, he was all about the plot, and then the artist would fill in you know, the stuff that Stan couldn't bother sure. himself with, and then he'd dialogue it when he would get the pages. And in fact, in his first animation gig, that's how he tried to approach the material. Did he do Marvel style for animation? What's called Marvel style. Yes. Plot first, write the script. He, yes. Or, or I should say, create the animation and then and then write the dialogue. Yes. And he would have uh, crazy on the first uh, Fantastic Four series at uh, I think it was Hanna Barbera. The old one in the sixties. Yeah, the one the one where they had a uh, didn't was the one there was a robot in. Okay, so that was the seventies one. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. No, yeah, no I am, but I am talking about the one in the sixties. Okay, because I've seen the storyboards that Jack did. Yeah, okay, because yeah, Human Torch is in the original. Yeah, and basically what Jack would do was a comic book, but, you know, on board paper. And then the guys would have to come in and uh, indicate the camera directions, you know, tightening in on the shot. And the, Are you the confusing that with the Marvel superheroes uh, cartoons that were no, literally I, lifted on no, the comic pages? No, in fact, I, I just okay. recently saw the storyboards. Okay, uh, go on, yeah, please. And people have to basically say to Stan, it, it, you can't do that. It doesn't work that way. Sure. You know, you have to write the dialogue first, time the track, yeah. and then board the show, you know. Yes. Well, the first time I met with him, he said to me, well, you know, I, I don't really know that much about animation. And I'm like, and that's supposed to inspire confidence. Why? Because you've been in the business for 20 years. So you're either being disingenuously false or you're making me nervous, <laughs> you know? but, but anyway, the, the problem, right, let me just cut to the chase. When they fired me from Spider-Man, I found out that Avi Arad called in the writers that I had brought in and said, you know nothing about Spider-Man and summarily dismissed them. The writers were letting in Marv Wolfman, Jerry Conway, and Mark Dematis. 
all of whom were working on shows for me, but they knew nothing about Spider-Man. So, very interesting. Wow, man, crazy. Yeah. Well, and you, you, uh, one of the things we talked about, possibly talking about here, uh, was the relationship now between. Uh, the the entities of Warner Brothers and Disney, and how they how they treat the publishing end. Well, w once the exploitation of these characters, superheroes in mass media, became big business, the dynamic changed. Now, and, and I can point out the very very specifically the day that it did. Uh, the Wall Street Journal ran a piece that Variety picked up about how Time Warner stockholders should exploit. DC, or Warner Brothers, for not more effectively exploiting their library. What year was this? Uh, or a year-ish? About 2001. That early? Okay, I would assume based 2000, on 2000, the reaction to Iron Man and everything. Well, it was, the, it, was the, it was the first year that the trade papers did full-color supplements on the San Diego Comic-Con. It, it was the first year that you know, San, San Diego became the Con Film Festival in spandex, you know? Sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Let's go down and make a deal by the sea, you know? Um, <laughs> well, once they discovered that, then the dominoes started falling over. And the, the, the total paradigm shift from the, the situation I described started to take place. We're selling a created universe. And that's, that's working out for them. But of course, to service that, an entire business apparatus had to be created, which is why you have all of these people in Burbank now, and presumably they're all in Burbank, because on the Disney end, they're in Burbank. No, no, they're all in Burbank, you're right. Um, Whose, whose job it is to, to keep track of who created what, how do we give them credit, forget about the contracts, forget about the back of the check, forget about the vouchers that were signed. It's a whole new ballgame. Basically, it's the business of who do we have to worry about suing us today, which is how you get these bizarre permutations. For example, Batman is now created by Bob Kane with Bill Finger, as opposed to, no, we don't mention Bill Finger as if he ever existed. So I mean, it's it's it, it's amazing. Um, nobody says things like, "Well, who's this Doctor Light, and what does she have to do with the Flash, and why is she in this show?" You know, because you've got Jeff Johns, now the president of DC Entertainment, right there in the room. I understand from you that the relationship is a little, a little bit different now on the Marvel end. They're kind of distancing themselves. Well, yeah, after, uh, last fall, uh, Kevin Feige went to Alan Horn, the head of Disney Films, because he had been frustrated by, as it's been reported, Ike Perlmutter, the head of Marvel's cheapness when it comes to the movies, because Perlmutter had a say. And they would maybe develop a uh, an idea for a film, and Perlmutter would say, "No, that's too expensive. You got to cut it down." And you know, the, the Marvel, Marvel had the Marvel movie panel of the creators and uh, publisher Dan Buckley and Joe Casada and Brian Bendis and Alan Fine looking over the script and, and making creative suggestions. I think to the benefit of that. But apparently, Perlmutter was a guy that kind of held onto the purse strings. So Feige went to Alan Horn, head of Disney Films, and said, "I've made you seven billion dollars with these Marvel movies." I'd rather not have to deal with Ike Perlmutter anymore. And Alan Horn said, sounds good to me. So now there is a barrier between Marvel Comics and the films. The television side is still working with the comics. But, um, yeah, and then that's why there was an Inhumans movies on, on uh, you know, the production end. And it technically is still there. But they seem to have distanced themselves from that idea on film. Meanwhile, television has embraced the Inhumans. They're part of S.H.I.E.L.D. And we're seeing that continue. So, and yeah. the, the very fact that those kinds of conversations are taking place at that level is certainly an indicator that this is serious big business. Oh, yeah. It, 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 it amazes me, frankly. Um, you know, I mean, as someone who has dealt with these characters in live action film, te television, animation, um, the idea of being employable on that level would, would, was a, an unattainable dream when I was most active at doing it. Um, and in fact, when I got my uh, gig on the Twilight Zone, uh, my agent had an uphill battle, even though you know they loved my scripts, because 
Phil Begay, the executive producer, had found out that I had done comics. And Phil had had a horrible experience at Universal as the writer, director, and producer of the two-hour Doctor Strange movie, which is uh, was not his finest hour, and he knew it. And he, he just developed this real hostility uh, toward comics as a result of it, and it was a tremendous prejudice. Now you can, you know, write a ticket, uh, you can, you know, for yourself if you have a comics background, but you couldn't at that time. It was a liability; you had to hide it. Man, and I, you know, you're so and Len and Marv and mm -hmm. Jerry Conway, mm -hmm. all, all you guys, I mean, you know, all the TV that you did and, and film mm -hmm. and everything, I mean, it's... Well, you know, it was, but it was cartoons. It, it was a ghetto. You know? Well, but weren't, didn't you guys work on the, didn't you also work on the Superboy TV show? Um, that was one of those things where, you know, I pitched that I had a deal with Fred Freiberger to do a show, and then the writers got strike hit. Oh, no kidding. At that point, yeah. Kerry Bates and Mark Jones, who was a guy I knew in animation, were the story editors at that time. Uh, and that was, I think, the first season. Or... I, I don't really recall. Which one was it that Mike Carlin was heavily involved in? Was that the I, second one? Yeah, well, I can't remember if it was the first or second Superboy series. I mean, it was the same producers, I think, and they just replaced the leads, right? Wasn't it always those universal syndicated shows? Um, well, it, was, it was done on a Viacom, and it was, uh, oh. it was the, the Salkins. Uh, right, that's right, yes. The, the, yeah, the guys who had the, the movie license. Yeah, they were the, the show. Ilya, the son, and Pierre Spengler were the you know, nominal executive producers of that show. And that was a, also a, a setback because they were very cooperative with DC, and all of the input was very comic book centric. And so you had a spectacle of people like, I, I think it was, was it Michael J. Pollard as Mick Zespitler? And well cast. But he's in the costume from the comics with the derby and the crazy stuff. And the thing. Yikes. They didn't understand at that time that a transliteration of that stuff to live action is inherently goofy. goofy. Yeah, yeah, it looks goofy. Yeah. yeah. And what they're doing now with, you know, the Kevlar vests and all of the things, that, you know, to approximate the look of the characters, mute the colors, make it look less garish, make it look more like, you know, um, street fighting action yeah. than Spanish index is very intelligent. I, uh, but unfortunately, fans are frustrated by the fact that they seem to want to reinvent the wheel every time out of the gate. Well, they found out that there's big business in that, too, and I was present in one of those uh, revelations. Batman the Animated Series, when we first started out, there was a tremendous argument. The studio wanted Batman to be black, in a totally black costume. And DC pushed back. Warner Brothers Animation was sort of in the middle. And this debate raged while we were continuing to produce the show. And all of us were told, just go ahead. Just keep doing it the way you're doing it. DC finally prevailed by making the argument that you can think of the iterations of Batman as simply different product groups. And then all of a sudden, we started having these style guides. There would be the DC style guide for Batman DCU, Batman animated, Batman feature films. And every time there was a new feature film, there was a new style guide. And Kenner and Hasbro and all of the licensees brought into this. Wow, instead of just one product line, we've got three, ka-ching, ka-ching, and we were off to the races, and that's where we are now. Man, I would love to see a, a financial pie, because that is something that sometimes gets lost on comic book fans. Licensing is so important. Now with television and film making the money that it does, it would still be interesting to see how that financial pie works out. I imagine that licensing still might, I, I don't know. I, well, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm wrong. That's why I failed. Well, the questions, now, well, the questions that we used to ask ourselves are even more difficult to answer, such as what, drive, what product drives what? You still cannot make an argument that uh, mass media presence drives comic book sales. It's just not true. Why? Because comics are a low margin business and everything else isn't. <laughs> so, but what I mean is, they don't care. They really don't care. Um, for a long time, the argument justifying the existence of the two major 
mainstream publishers was that they were low-cost R&D for their corporate parents. Uh, the ship sailed on that argument a long time ago because in many ways, the stuff being done on television and in features, I, I would argue, is more imaginative. It's certainly more accessible to a broader audience. Um, but do we have numbers on how many of those audience, how much of the audience are hardcore fans being cultivated by the, by the studios, and how much are uh, a mass audience being brought in to the tent, if you will? We don't have those. We don't have that information, as far as I know, any more than the average retailer can tell you whether a free comic book day brings in any more kids into the business. Um, and frankly, fans are the only people who really care. I would I would argue. Um, the corporate entities care to the extent that they have to cultivate the fan constituency. But, but, but if you can make the argument that they're irrelevant, the world will change again tomorrow. Well, and you even have a theory about that, that um, we talked about on, on the podcast, but I wouldn't mind hearing your thoughts if a day were to come where because comics are for the big publishers, such a small piece of the pie that maybe they would decide, you know, we don't need to make these. Lucas Films did not publish its own Star Wars comics before being part of, of Disney and now Marvel. They licensed it to Dark Horse. And we had two decades of really good Star Trek or Star Wars comics that were vetted by Lucas but weren't published by Lucas and therefore we had more creative voices. So could you see, you know, talk about that. Well, Comics, for a long time, uh, in the 60s and 70s, were utterly dependent on their licensing. The only reason why DC was able to continue publishing Superman throughout the 50s, when superheroes were totally cold, was that he was on television. And so the paradigm became, <clears throat> excuse me, that the licensing, you know, gives us the soil in which to grow the, the, the flowers of the okay. comics. Sure. And, and, and uh, Paul Evitz and, uh, and Jeanette Collins, basic goal at DC when they took over it was, we're going to turn this company into one that is profitable on its own terms, on the basis of publishing operations and not on licensing. And, and they succeeded in that goal. And then, the, you know, you had your... your the, the boom with the, you know, sealing things in plastic bags and all the rest of that, shipping five million of this and so on. Back in the 90s, yeah. Yeah. And then that bubble burst. Yes, hard. And, <laughs> hard. Yeah. And then they were, then they were put back in a defensive crouch. Well, we're, we're low-cost R&D. Companies like IDW don't need to be concerned with licensing. They don't license out. They, li <clears throat> they license in. They have an economic model that can make that work. Dark Horse is a little bit different. I mean, they've scored their biggest successes in their licensed product, but they're home for a lot more creator-owned stuff Absolutely. than IDW. IDW has proven itself a very effective strategic partner with DC, and it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest if their corporate parents said, well, what do we need to be printing pamphlets for? What do we need to be in the book publishing business for? Warner Brothers doesn't want to be. In fact, Warner Publishing was sold off uh, about 10 years ago. Okay. And the only Warner Brothers publishing entity, per se, is DC Comics. Wow. Um, and they do some subcontracting work for uh, Warner Brothers Worldwide Publishing. Is Simon & Schuster then? A, okay, yeah, but I was going to ask, like, some of the other publishing things that, as I remember, were part of the Warner Brothers about... No, no, Simon & Schuster, was, that was Paramount. Uh, uh, oh, excuse me. Puff and Western. Oh, okay. But, yeah, I do know Warner Books. There were no other prestige publishers. I'm trying to think other than Time Warner itself. And you're right, yeah, Time. I mean, Time Magazine and, well, and whatever it is. And the weird was. thing was, most of the other... Other publishing entities didn't want to have anything to do with the comics. That was beneath them. So 
Jeanette had to fight like hell to get Warner Books to do anything with the DC properties. Those Superman from the 30s to 70s books, they weren't published by Warner? I know Bonanza was like the, 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 you know, the and, publisher. And the, and the confusion about a lot of those trade paperbacks is that you know DC owned the copyright. And if the original publisher didn't want to go back, Crown Books, by the way, I believe, was the publisher that okay. you're talking about. Okay. Um, if they felt, if licensed publishing felt they could set it up with another publisher um, on more favorable terms, and the original publisher didn't, didn't want to go back to press on it, it was theirs to do with, you know, as, as, they, as they wanted. Uh, that was the case with the original Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman encyclopedias that Michael Fleischer did in the 70s, and basically uh, Simon Schuster uh, came up with the idea a couple of years ago of taking those three books and making them into expanded encyclopedias. I worked on the Superman volume. Yep. Oh, my God. Yep. Uh, I mean, you know, the manuscripts were this... You know, I had those originals. They want, and they wanted... They were like telephone books. They wanted everything. But the, yeah. prob the problem with the Superman <laughs> encyclopedia, though, was that they kept, you know, changing the continuity in Superman, and the entries kept increasing. And I have, I'm on the phone with the editor saying, what's the end point? And the editor would just say, well, we want it all. We want it all. Wow. And so I'm getting copies of, um, the, there was the, the, the new Krypton sequence when we were doing it. We, you know, Jeff Johns was reinventing the wheel. Yes. Era, right? And they're sending me these scripts, and they're sending me stuff to say, right, you have to have an entry about this. You have to add that to this entry. Yeah. And I'm going, well, this is the Winchester Mystery House of Books. We're never going to get this thing finished. <laughs> you could do 20 pages on Monel and all the various changes from when he first appeared in Superboy to all the various reboots and no, different we, iterations. You'd have to cut the manuscript down to 20 pages on Monel. All right, I trust you. <laughs> I'm sure you probably did. <laughs> well, I, well, I, but the other thing was, it was all of equal value. There was no, you know, What's isn't, isn't this a part? short entry? Isn't this right? right. No, no, right. no, it's just it's, it's all it, we want it all. We want it all. Wow. So, you know, why did God invent the internet? You know, or, or Al Gore? Are there any opportunities to like for something like that, especially given the confines of a book, to instead almost develop a Superman? you know, website that has all that. I mean, certainly fans have done that, I think, to a degree with their own, you, oh, know, sure. you know, Superman homepage, which I love. Mm -hmm. Great, you know, mm -hmm. great website. And, you know, they do a tremendous job. But yeah, I mean, that, that and I don't even know how, you know, how to monetize that. If, or whatever, if, if the metrics can support um, an ad buy that makes sense, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see DC and Marvel start doing discrete websites, character-driven websites like that. I mean, we look at what DCE has done with DC's web presence. You know, it's become so slick, so sophisticated. Um, they're producing it out of Burbank. You've got you've got talking heads out of studios it, you're trying to make it look like entertainment tonight. Oh yeah, um, Entertainment Weekly is practically a fanzine at this point for the, the Warner Brothers. All the properties, yeah. They're, they're taking it seriously now in a way that they didn't as little as five years ago. And it's because it's something that was you know so far beyond the realm of possibility for somebody you know when he was at his most active in comics was possible that it's it's just it's you know forgive the cliche mind boggling <laughs> questions since before your sunburn hot in space i have awaited the question <laughs> <laughs> that would be the uh the Guardian of Forever. Yes, from, from city, city, on the city on the Edge of Forever. From the City on the Edge of Forever, absolutely. Any, any questions, guys? Because, again, we can ramble. Please go up to the microphone there, Ted. You think <laughs> we can ramble? Absolutely, man. Yeah, please. Going back to what you said, uh, I was really curious about, you said uh, the... Uh, about the lawsuits, and they're they're looking at all the different creators of somebody, mm -hmm. um, and I, I and it's like almost like a it's uh, watching like the Daredevil Netflix and uh, the, the credits and the thank yous. It's almost like a, a, a playing a game because you see these names like okay, well, what character did they are they you know you know they created Gunless and, and some like you know if this character created Hawkeye who uh, it's his name is in there now are they getting any kind of money money or just the thank you or are they just covering their butts? I mean, you said that they're not worried about. Their they're not worried about work for hire. Are they the Hollywood mm -hmm. thinking is mm -hmm. we should give these guys money and credit or not? Well, I think there is a little bit of competition going on between uh, 
uh, Disney and, and Warner Brothers, um, in terms of image um, regarding creator friendliness, um, I don't know what the policies are at Marvel, but I do know that at DC, they're, they're, they actively seek out um, creators to tell them, what have you contributed and we'll give you character payments. I mean, I'm, I'm making money off of a character I created for Supergirl that's in the current television series. What they do at Marvel, I, I don't know. But I do know that maybe there's a little more due, due diligence about who's contributed to what uh, that would be helpful on Daredevil. Um, for example, while they would, it was instrumental, even though you know he's an artist, and of course they don't use the yellow and black costume and all the rest of that, um, while he was a significant contributor in the creation of the character. Yeah, I was going to say, what's really weird about that is that if you watch the thank yous in Daredevil, I mean... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, just uh, just to make it clear, I haven't seen... No, no, no. ...who's credited in the... Right, in the but no, they, I just they, wanted to make know, it clear they, they why have, I was For some it. weird ways... I mean, is he absent from it? I yeah, haven't Spurlock's noticed. making a big deal. Yes, you know, Spurlock's, David Spurlock's supposed to be in charge sure. of the Wood State. Oh, that's right, yes. Uh, but what's so interesting is, like, I'll see... I saw George Tesca, and I'm like, what character? And it was like a character in a, in a Daredevil annual mm -hmm. that George Tesca drew, and it was a first time this character... So George gets the... Right. ...the listing. They've never listed Wally. They've listed everybody else. And then Frank Miller gets a special mm -hmm. billing in the thank yous, which is really interesting, too. Well, but you can, and I guess it's funny because a modern audience would say, well, sure, Frank created the Daredevil aesthetic, but really Wally did. You're right. I mean, yeah. you go back to that first well, issue. Well, this is when Electra showed up. They got uh, Frank. Oh, well, there you go. Well, that and, makes sense. That, that weird... That, that, I don't know what kind of, you know where that stands with Electra and Frank. Well, I mean, it's obviously Electra's a huge part of season right. two. But That's funny because I almost thought it would also, again, be because Frank kind of returned it to that Wally. Like, what, you're, what you're talking about, if I may, is retrofitting a definition of creator. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, a gray area in a lot of cases. The feature, uh, the Marvel feature films, they do they do the same thing, uh, but they're really burying the credits way mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. Now, like Stan or Jack, you know, up the front or Dick sure. But like the uh, either Black Widow or Hawkeye were right. created by some guy that never really is not a big name at all. Oh, he, had, he had to be the writer or the, or the artist of that particular he, issue. I was wondering if it's yeah. worth him. Uh, uh, I, don't know. Yeah. I forget his name. German name yeah. in the '60s. Yeah, it starts with a W. Right. And oh, when you're uh, yeah, when off. Yeah, when off. No, not Winter. No. Well, anyway, it is good. Right, right, right. It was just an obscure name that you know he's not a Gene Cohen level or uh, I hate Wally Wood. Sure. Or. Well, I can I can only speak to this from my own experience, and I'll give you an example. Traditionally, the assumption is every superhero character is co-created by a writer and an artist, right. unless they're the same person. Not always strictly true. The assumption on a character that I'd created. Uh, in Superman that they're using on Supergirl was that the Kurt Swan estate would get half of the payment and I would get the other until I produced the original sketches that I had drawn for the character which Kurt followed. Right. And so they said, okay, you get 100% of the, uh, the, the, the character payment. So in a lot of cases, they're making an assumption and in many cases, the people who were there at the creation of these characters are no longer with us. And they are, their estates, their children, their representatives may not necessarily have accurate information. Um, and in point of fact, I've seen a number of credits on stuff that I question. Why, for example, in the uh, Justice League animated stuff in which Aquaman appears, does the credit read Aquaman created by Paul Norris? as opposed to Aquaman created by Mort Weisinger and Paul Norris. I don't understand that. Yeah. Um, but, but, but I'm sure the lawyers have a reason. The bottom line, so you're saying that they are they are trying to be pretty active because you know uh, that's one thing about it, as comic book fans, we've always been so upset the work for hire and mm -hmm. you guys, you, all you guys, not getting the proper credit that you deserve or and, compensation. Uh, compensation, and now you're saying Hollywood is kind of scared, but are just scared of lawsuits, or they actually want to you know, do the right thing? Or well, you know, they, we're also talking about the possibility of a response to case law in instances that. We, you know, we can't know because you know settlements 
are you know, protected by you know, non-disclosure agreements. I don't know what the settlement of the Siegel State suit over Superman was. Obviously, there were wide-ranging ramifications. And anybody who has to use the Superboy character still doesn't know what the hell to do with it. Who does it belong to? Who does it, belong to? Who does it take? Which version of Superboy? Because part of that settlement was to abstract Superboy uh, from the Superman continuity. Um, so some of these things that don't make any sense to us, why credits are phrased the way they are, could be the result of legal precedent set in those actions and in some cases credits may be given not because they want to, not because out of the generosity of their heart and they're eager to throw money at people, but because the court has a loaded gun to their head saying do this or it's actionable. So this is what I mean when I say it's the department of who do we not want us to sue? <laughs> who do we not want to sue us to? Yeah. You know? Who knows uh, the character that Marty created that's in Supergirl? Anybody know? Oh, there we go. Oh, I care because it's an awesome character. It's one of my favorite 70s characters. Oh, God. For real. Nobody's saying anything. Anyway, I'm going to say I'm three, two, one. The Master Jailer. Moving on. The Master. I'm going to. I'm giving you your credit where credit's due, man. Are you kidding? No, and honestly, I know. Fine. That give me credit where credit is due. Talk about something that's worth giving me credit for. No. Well, I, I, you know, I was hoping someone was going to ask you about um, the difference between uh, your writing. Because, again, you were, you were kind of under the thumb of guy, a guy like Julie Schwartz. It seemed like. In the 80s, when we were getting things like your Blackhawk run and your Secret Six run, that there was more freedom. I know in the case of Blackhawk, you were following kind of what well, Jacob well, had set up, but it just felt like, you know, you... What excited me about doing that was that I, I you know, Blackhawk, hardcore Blackhawk fans, you know, cursed me. But I loved that graphic novel that he did. Yeah. And I remember reading that, and the top of my head blew off because I'd been working in television for about eight or nine years and had come to an understanding of the importance of scene structure and how to tell a story cinematically without relying over much on dialogue or, or text. And what Howard had created was, I mean, it was hardly unique, but it was my first exposure to a comic book, a graphic novel told in more cinematic terms, didn't use captions, didn't use thought balloons. And this is why, you know, how it trans, trans, excuse me, transitioned into being a, a successful TV writer. Too. Absolutely. Because he understood scene structure. He understood point of attack. He, he understood where to button a scene. And he understood how to control the scene as a writer and then execute it as an artist. And to me, the most destructive concept in terms of preventing comics from becoming cinematic has been the so-called Marvel method or the, the plot first, pencils, then dialogue. Because the scenes, the scenes are not necessarily controlled or structured by people who understand scene structure. You don't need to have soliloquizing. You don't need to have Spider-Man swinging around talking to himself. You know how to construct a scene. And those few who start to begin to understand that think it's about trading exposition. Well, even when a scene is expository, what you have to do is build conflict into it. Why does that character need that information? As opposed to the beginner's mistake of, well, as you know, you know, yesterday Krypton, or, or, or whatever. And that's one of the things that I think the TV shows, even more so than the films, do better even than the comics. One of the things, though, that's really disappointing to me about the feature films is that they're now being written like bad comics. There's a difference between characterization and iconography, and we're too damn dependent on icons and our assumptions about them and the images that we have in our heads of these characters. As screenwriters, we've become lazy. Look at, I'm going to... I'm going to be critical here, pesky Pasco. Superman or Batman versus Superman, Yawn of Justice, as I call it. 
We don't need to make you care about Bruce Wayne. We don't even need to tell you who the hell Bruce Wayne is. We'll just show him running around, saving people from buildings collapsing, and we'll, you'll know he's the hero. But besides, you're a fan. You're here already. We've sold you. We don't have to win you over. We don't have to make you care about these characters. It's in the bag. You're already on our side. And that's lazy writing. And in both of Zack Snyder's films, it's the same thing. They open with this flurry of action, all this stuff running around, and I'm sitting there going, it's noisy, it's assaultive, and I don't care. Engage my emotions. Make me care about this character. Why is he doing what he's doing? Oh, but he's a hero. That's Everybody what heroes do. Everybody knows Batman. Oh, shit. <laughs> There's a reason, and when this stuff works, it's because a writer has dug into the character and found the reason that it works. And in some cases, the TV cherry picks from the best ideas uh, of the comics. Um, so much of what Mark Waid and you know, Jeff Johns, obvious, obviously because he's in the room, um, what they contributed to Flash sure. underscores all of that, but it's right there. This is, this is a man outrunning the past. This is a man running toward answers. I am the fastest man. But the irony of all of these, these tropes is that the more powerful they are, there is always one point in their life where they are powerless. Superman, for all of his power, still can't bring us peace in the Middle East still can't save the lives sometimes of the people most important to him. One of the, one of the most frustrating concepts for me was when John Byrne said, let's keep Mom and Pa Kent alive. Well, I understood that. You know, he, he wanted to get off the, the, the Boy Scout curse. He wanted to play Superman in his younger and more relatable to the audience. And he thought it was important for him to have people that he could talk to and go back to for advice. But what that also removed was the tragedy of him being alone. alone. The most powerful man in the world who couldn't save his parents' lives. Twice. The most powerful man in the world. And yet, in some ways, powerless. And that, that duality, that internal conflict is what makes these characters, in my opinion, inherently interesting. Not their powers, not what they can do with them, not the fancy clothes they dress up in, and not the cool people that they hang out with. But that dark night of the soul, where they have problems that all of us can relate to, they're just on another level. The powers are metaphors. And unless writers can learn to think in those terms, we're just going to keep getting flat, boring, and uninteresting, unemotionally engaging comics, and that's why the sales are dropping. The TV people, the movie people, the screenwriters, they understand that better than the comic book writers. Or at least they did. Because now we're starting to see stuff that's written just as lazily. I don't need to reach out to you and sell you. In other words, there's no presumption of sales resistance on the part of the audience anymore. They've bought in. And it's shooting fish in the barrel. So lazy work begets stuff that is emotionally unengaging and nobody wants to go see. It's spectacle versus story and character. Because Absolutely. that's what it seems to be in the films. And I've heard it, like really great filmmakers complain about the box office blockbusters and saying, yeah, there's no there there beyond the spectacle. That's exactly the phrase that goes so, in my head. There's no there there. No, yeah. I'm with you. Do you want to tease your, your ambition for uh, what you'd like to do with your website as we close? One of the things that's come off of these word Bloom's podcast that we've done is, you know, he, you ought to teach. I'd love to learn from you. The people saying this to me, and it surprises me that, you know, they would have that feeling. So finally I thought, okay, but there are a lot of websites out there now. You know, we'll teach you how to write and draw comics. You know, and, and they're being offered by people who haven't done anything. You know, some, some guy who works as an assistant editor at Marvel for three weeks has now got a website. He's going to teach you how to write comics. As if an editor in this business could teach you to write comics anymore because they don't hire people who used to do the stuff to be editors anymore. But I didn't want to, you know, the master class, the book on comics, Denny O'Neill did that. I didn't want to do that. So what I'm going to do 
December 1st is the deadline I've imposed on myself for the launching of a website in which I will offer my services as a writing coach in both comics and animation. And what that means is you would come with a project that you wanted to develop. The goal, the nature of it, the content is entirely up to you. And you would express what your goals were for it. Graphic novel, ongoing series, animated series, screenplay, whatever. Television pilot. And I will walk you through the steps of the process in order to get to that final draft, in final draft, of whatever it is that you want to do. And a personal service thing, and you do it at various stages. I'm not telling you what's right. I'm not telling you what's good. That's not my business. What I want to do is tell them how to get where they want to go. Structure. And if structure, characterizations, uh, you know. Whatever's missing. Exactly. Or, or whatever I would suggest they need to think about in order to get where they want to go. And, uh, you know, as I say, I've had some incredible teachers and I've had a, a wonderful career because of, and I still am, having a wonderful career because of what I've learned. And this is the only way I can think of to give that back. And not incidentally, you know, let's be honest, capitalism is what it is. <laughs> Make a little money, but, you know, not exploitative. No, no. no. So that's, that's what I'm working on now in addition to the other animations. Well, if you're, if you're interested in uh, what you've heard today, mm -hmm. and, and really, uh, this is one of the reasons why I love talking to the guy as much as we do, and it's not enough. I, I, you know, there's a time where I know you're like, let's do a podcast every week, and I'm like, oh, if only I had that time. I would love to do that because you're full of stories, you're full of perspective, and I truly do appreciate you know, that. You know, John, so. I said, I want to do well, I know. a podcast every well, week. But I'd help you. That's what you're saying. You're saying coming to me, and I'd, I'd, believe me, I would love to be the producer of the Marty Pasco podcast. Um, but, you know. but, <laughs> not at all. No. Oh, not at all. Are you kidding? I don't think of this. No, no, no. I want to compete with you. <laughs> not, not at all, man. No, no, seriously. I, I really do. I, and I would say follow Marty on Facebook. And as this new project develops, I know he has other things in the works. Uh, but uh, as you can tell from this conversation, really interesting perspectives from Marty Pasco. And I'm glad he was well, able to share John, those with us it's, today. It's time to stop this. I know. I was I was, 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 was admiration because in two minutes, these people want to see the press and they really came into the Oh, not at all. No, no, no. And, I mean, no, there, I, I, I think you were... Uh, Say hi to Brian for me. Absolutely, man. But no, Marty Pasco, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all very much. It was fun being here.